Okay. So, hello everyone. As uh, Alex presented, I'm going to talk about this uh, paper, Open Science Safe Slides, presenting results from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic research. So, first of all, uh, introducing myself, I'm a researcher in human-computer interaction and visualization, so I work mostly on how to interact and present 3D data, but not only 3D data, as you can see here are some examples, but also, for instance, how to make images that are initially shocking, a bit less shocking and still informative. Uh, but during my PhD, uh, I started getting interested in all things open science and, of course, in the reproducibility crisis. So I got interested in statistics um, and recently published a paper on uh, the replication crisis that Alexander just presented uh, on the threats of the replication crisis in empirical computer science and uh, looking if there's actually any threats uh, and the uh, spoilers there are. I've also been looking a little bit in uh, how to present statistical results, like all the words we can put into it, like uh, some form of linguistic research. Uh, and there will soon be a preprint on this that I call Definitely Maybe, uh, some of a reference to famous uh, rock band uh, from the UK. Uh, but the preprint is not available yet. Anyways, coming back to the topic, uh, of course the paper will be cited as this, but it's, uh, it's a huge collaboration and I want to thank all my colleagues for the work they put into this. Um, you can see all of us here. Some of the photos are not uh, up to date, as you can see from me, uh, the hair is growing a lot. Um, but yeah, it's a huge collaboration. It's national from France, from the UK, Sweden, China, Australia. Uh, lots of people coming from lots of different places. Uh, and it all started uh, on Twitter with, with the COVID-19 research and headlines that we saw, such as these, uh, for instance, the Lancet retraction uh, with the Surgeon Fair scandal. Or looking also at how people share the research online, such as this paper that you can see from the South of France, uh, that was peer reviewed and published in less than a day, and for which one of the co authors is also part of the editorial team, which we found a little bit shady uh, potentially. Um, and one evening, uh, or rather night, I started looking into this more and more, all the papers from this team. And I found that most of the papers you can see in the right most, uh, in the middle column were actually peer reviewed in uh, a day or very little time. And you can see on the right most column that uh, almost all of them had editorial campaign of interest, which is uh, a little bit shady. So I posted this image online on Twitter around 4 or 5 a.m. and woke up to something like two, 300 uh, Twitter notifications the next day with people saying, oh, let's see if it maybe this practice is uh, uh, shared more than just by this group. Uh, and it's also made the process. So that's how we ended up with this paper uh, that I'm going to present quickly uh, right now. So Alexander mentioned the, the publication and research, uh, let's say, knowledge uh, creation pipeline. Uh, we also take that and we take potential issues and solutions that I'm going to present. But first, let's focus on the first step of all of this, the data collection and interpretation. So we looked at a paper on retraction watch. There were 29 of them that were about COVID-19 that were retracted. And out of these 29, we found that eight were retracted because of uh, the study design or the analysis of the data. So that's one first problem. Now, looking at you know, a global pandemic, you would expect that lots of different treatments would be investigated and uh, the research would be conducted on other treatments on the side as well. What happened for COVID is that a lot of effort went into one treatment in particular. And we're not going to lie, this one treatment was hydroxychloroquine. Uh, it was advertised a lot and there were lots of trials conducted. The issue with that is that Many of these papers, many of these studies were actually also having issues with their study design or analysis of the data. And so in an ideal world, you can think, OK, if we want to see uh, other treatments being investigated, it's just a matter of time, right? But I mean, when it comes to medical research, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Money comes into play and also participants. So all of these resources were actually mostly gathered on hydroxychloroquine and potentially some other treatment a little bit. But that removes the opportunity to conduct more research on other treatments potentially forever. So the one step towards usually a better data analysis is per registration. But in the case that we mentioned of waste of research effort with the issues that we mentioned, per registration is not going to be enough. So you can advocate for registered reports. Registered reports basically consist in having your study design peer reviewed before you conduct any data analysis so that people would see, OK, this study design is, uh, is far enough, it's good enough, it's robust enough, conduct the research, gather the data, report on it, or we'll publish it. So it's a two-stage peer review kind of thing. Uh, so on this first, first step of data collection, we saw a waste of research through a lot of potentially not useful duplication. Uh, we had ethical concerns that we also highlight in the paper and we had flawed studies. So the solutions to these are pro-registrations and register reports, but they only work if everything is made public, right? Because if you don't want to duplicate research, you need to know what the others have pre-registered 
or what registered report it submitted about it. So, who has to adopt this? Of course, researchers have to adopt it, but journals also have to enforce it and to offer the possibility to do it. Today, not all journals offer the possibility to submit registered reports. Coming back now to the publication process part of the creation and sharing of knowledge. So here, I mentioned this before when I introduced uh, the problem, we had this paper, for instance, that was uh, reviewed very, very fast and for which one of the co-authors was part of the editorial team. So we decided to see if it was a more common problem. So we looked at PubMed and extracted the data from all the papers that we had back in June last year uh, on COVID-19. And we found more than 8,000 papers with their peer review time available. And then we categorized these papers into papers published or peer reviewed and published in less than a day, in 16 days and in 20 days, which were the mean and median uh, review time. And so we had huge files like this for which we had to click on each paper uh, to get the author list and then manually check the author list with uh, the editorial team. Uh, one thing we did extra is we categorized paper into more or less viewpoint or editorial papers for which it's probably not a, really an issue to have conflict of interest with the editorial team because it's often invited papers anyways uh, or written by the editors themselves but for research articles you would expect that there would be less of these. Uh, so here are the results quickly going through this. You can see at the top the research articles only and at the bottom we have the reviews, editorial viewpoints and letters gathered together. Uh, with separate time of review of one day or less, 16 days and 20 days. And if we look here, these three graphs are the different types of conflict of interest. So with the editor in chief, associate editors or editors, and we have here the aggregated picture. So let's just look at that for now. Uh, what we can see here, first of all, is that if review time increases, we have the editorial conflict of interest decreasing, right, the percentage of them. Uh, another thing we can notice is that we would expect a huge difference between research articles and reviews and editorials, but actually the difference is not that big, right? So if you don't have open reviews to check how thorough the reviews have been, it's very, very hard to know if the reviews that these papers like, went through in a day or less were actually thorough or not. And so that's why we came up with these recommendations for, for journals and authors. So authors should always highlight in the manuscript and its metadata any affiliation with the editorial board of the journal to which they submit the paper. Journals should also explicitly state how the peer review process was conducted. So they should state how many referees they recruited, how long the recruiting took, uh, how long the duration of the review for the uh, reviewers were, and how long the editorial decision took to uh, make. Also, we want the, of course, the referees report to be made available transparently with the manuscript. So actually the authors, but also the viewers and the scientific community overall can benefit from the constructive comments in the open reviews and check how thorough they were. Um, and when publications report on quantitative findings, we would like to say that like this, it's been introduced in some journals, but like probably a statistical methodology reporting should be conducted by statisticians. Now looking again at the Sergius Fear scandal, so you know, the, the Lancet retraction and NEGM retraction, um, it all happened because the data was not available. So uh, we looked again at the retraction rules, we found four papers that were retracted because of missing and or fraudulent data. Uh, so the solution to this is pretty obvious, open materials and open data, right? So here comes our guidelines for this. Um, First of all, we want all research materials for data generation or collection to be made publicly available on the platforms that are available for this, uh, and ideally under a CC BY license. Uh, we want data to be shared by default. Uh, authors should not be able to submit a manuscript if they do not provide access to the raw data and the scripts for the analysis, or if they don't have a valid reason for, it not, for them not to do it. And you would think that it's already the case in many journals, but it's actually not the default yet in all journals. And furthermore, we think that it's not enough. Like in the case that authors cannot share the data, which can happen for lots of reasons, ethical or uh, legal reasons, we want journal editors uh, to demand that the raw data still be examined by a trusted third party so that they can establish the existence of the data, but also validate the results from the analysis. So whoever this third party is, is still a little bit unknown, right? It should be in agreement beforehand with all authors, institutions and publishers so that you can find a trusted third party for this is a governmental institution to just check that the data exists and then uh, report that to the journal and say that it's okay. Uh, and finally, to facilitate meta-analysis, we want the abstract of all manuscript to contain the link to pre-registration numbers and repositories, but also perhaps to include all of this information in the paper's XML information for an even easier retrieval of this uh, with text mining. So looking at the publication process, we found that uh, fast reviewing, 
additional conflict of interest and potential distrust of published results was an issue. Solutions to this are open reviews, data and code sharing, and disclosure of conflict of interest with the editor or team included. Now, who should uh, uh, adopt this? Of course, researchers and journals, but it's not enough, right? Like reviews are barely valued today, for instance. We want institutions and funding agencies to value reviewing, to value also the sharing of code, sharing of data uh, through their official call for funding, for instance, or other things that they use to evaluate researchers. Now getting to the last part of this pipeline, the communication of uh, science. So one thing that we noticed is that, you know, publishers said that because of COVID-19, they would make uh, all their papers on COVID-19 uh, open access. That's, that's great, but if you want to find a vaccine or a treatment for COVID, you might need papers that are not directly related to COVID-19 to be accessible, such as virology papers. And so uh, that was not the case uh, for these, some of these papers, at least. Now, looking at the uh, preprint archives, we saw an increase in submission, and that's, that's great. That's a good thing. What might not be such a good thing is that if these preprints are used in the media, that might be problematic. So uh, we wanted to see if it was the case or not. And an easy way to do this is to look at Altmetric. So Altmetric is a tool that lets you see how research papers or any research output is used in different kind of things with like a score that you see here, but also you see if it's been shared in news, in blogs, in tweets, Wikipedia pages, Reddit, and others. So we tried looking at preprint usage uh, through Altmetric. Uh, from the 1st of January 2020 to the 30th of June 2020, and we separated the paper between COVID-related and non-COVID-related. And what we find here, so we have here the percentage of preprints shared at least once in any of these. Um, and we can see that for Twitter, the numbers are very, very high, and that's probably due to automation, right? A lot of these bots are just like created to just share preprints that are posted on archive or bio-archive right away, so that makes sense. But if you look at news, uh, we see that preprints in COVID-19, which shared approximately 10 times more than other preprints, which is a little bit worrying because preprints are by default not peer reviewed. And although peer review is not a flawless process, it can help a little bit in filtering out some of the uh, problematic papers. Uh, so an obvious solution to this is to have more communication between journalists and scientists so that scientists could actually perhaps quickly look at the preprint to see if the findings are exaggerated or if the methodology is flawed. That would be a, a one naive solution, but we know that it's much more complicated than this, of course, because there's uh, pressing finance, financial matters for journals and it's, uh, or newspapers, and it's also a little bit complicated because, well, scientists are not paid to communicate with the press anyways. But well, looking at communication, we found a potential misuse of preprints by the, by the news. Uh, we also found misleading headlines and exaggerations and still pay with manuscript. Um, solution is, as I said, more collaboration between journalists and scientists, but it's a little bit naive. We elaborate more on this in the paper and open access on all manuscript, no matter what. Uh, now, who has to do that? Well, we want journalists and news editors to, of course, push to this more, but also scientific institutions. And we want researchers to favor open access and policymakers and institutions to somehow get to enforce it so that journalists don't have to choose more either. Considering the misleading headlines and exaggerations, it comes back to this preprint, soon to be preprint that I mentioned before. I won't dive into more detail about this, but feel free to chat me about it. So, looking at the pipeline that we have here, we, we are aware that this part of the potential issues was here before COVID, right? But it, it didn't happen because of COVID. But maybe COVID actually accentuated this a little bit, potentially at least. Uh, and we know that all of this doesn't come from just like the urgency of the matter with the pandemic. It's also all linked to the wrong incentives that researchers have with the, all these metrics around research, the H index, the impact factor, uh, which drive potentially bad uh, research behaviors. And eventually, of course, the publisher perish, which is also pushing researchers to publish more and more and spend less time on quality. Uh, so this has been documented a lot in um, research papers before, uh, there's lots of contributions, you can find a lot of them online, really I'm just pointing to one or two here. We wrote a blog post about this uh, one or two years ago with one of my co-author, Paola, and with uh, John Tennant as well. Uh, but there's also an amazing initiative from people such as this one, Bulletin to Bad Science, that I would like to mention. Uh, and to finish this, when we published the preprint, we asked all the researchers that we knew and we shared a lot on Twitter to get feedback on the manuscript and to ask people to co-sign if they agree with the solution we found, the open science is a general thing, and the issues that we found in, in described in the manuscript. And we had 371 of them signing this. You can still sign it, it's not pre-registered anymore, but you can still sign it if you want to. Uh, you can find the link in the paper. 
uh, quite easy to find. But uh, yeah, that's about it for me. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Lonnie. I'll, I'll join you for the, um, for the Q&A now. That was wonderful. That was really, really interesting. Um, so we've already um, got a few questions. Um, yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to start with the one that was um, the most kind of highly upvoted from James. So James asked, do we know how the retraction rate in COVID articles compares to the retraction rate in non COVID articles, uh, i.e. outside of the pandemic? Don't know if you know that. Um, no, I, we don't have the figures. Also, like our figures are now a little bit updated. This was uh, up until June uh, last year. So there's more COVID-19 papers that are being tried for sure. It's really hard to compare because uh, there's two or three things to take into account. One is that lots of papers should probably be reflected that haven't been COVID or non-COVID. So the figures are always like, you know, it's just an estimation. And I don't think it says much about the percentage of research papers that actually are problematic. And the other thing is that the COVID-19 papers have had a lot of scrutiny over them, right? Like because everyone, whether it was their field or not, looked at the papers, uh, even like lay people, uh, which is probably your first like in history and maybe a good thing maybe not that's a, that's a different topic but no we don't have that number but i'm not sure it would make sense to compare because of these reasons brilliant thank you that was a, that was a really comprehensive answer um so let's see what the next one is so the next one is uh from anonymous um asking saying peer review can be long enough Adding on a third party statistical review would add on to this wait time for publications. How would you suggest this work in practice, especially the statisticians are so high in demand already? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, and I think it comes from the issue. There's, there's two things to mention there. So I think that no matter what, I think preprints are a good thing. Like I, I depicted a pretty wrong picture of preprints right now, but like when, when you have results, put them on preprints. I just I just thought and presented the fact that maybe the press shouldn't use it, but like preprint would be like, okay, you got the results, you publish it. But maybe a better way around this, like before you collect anything, uh, do the register report kind of thing, right? And and if so, if you submit a registered report and a statistician, statistician looks at it, then you're good to go. Whatever you will get in the end will, will be nice. But I agree that uh, they're in a lot of demand already, all the statisticians. And the issue they have is one of the ones that we have as well, that reviews are not really like counted in their work. So why would they spend time reviewing papers, not even from their field, if they get nothing from it? And I think it's very hard to say how to implement this in the end. Uh, I guess it will eventually boil down to being able to change how the system works a little bit uh, so that would be possible but I mean all the changes that we are looking for today ask for this also so yeah it's, it's I don't have a clear answer on the approach and how to do this I think it's it would be nice to try different things but really I think it all boils down to making reviewing part of a scientist's life and work for real like not just something that you do because you like your scientific field mm. or research topic yeah, I think I think that's really interesting because because COVID research is pretty much just regular research, but it is sped up because of the um, kind of highly time sensitive nature of it. Um, so that, that's that's really interesting to keep in mind. So Ian asked um, of the solutions you propose highlight, which do you think is the most important if you had to prioritize and why? Oh, wow. Uh, tricky one. Um... I think looking so looking at the COVID case more than anything right now, I think what matters is really getting data. So I would prioritize open data out of all of these things, open data and materials, like if we could group that, uh, because, you know, this the, I've been recently involved in reviewing and uh, like current spending with, with editors about papers out there that are not from my field, but I could see the flaws in there and I don't have access to the data. So I can't actually reanalyze and see what was wrong or what bias they might have. I have to just read what the author did, which took me much longer than just playing with the code. Uh, and I'm guessing that's always the case. And I'm guessing that if you're conducting research on, I don't know, um, COVID cases and kids, you would really much, for instance, have, like to have the data from all countries and have it in a proper fashion. So having a proper platform for all data and like having all offers systematically share the data and code, I think would push for more advances in science in the long term hopefully i think that would be my yeah that would be my take on this but it's it's a very odd question to be fair yeah no definitely um okay so i think i think well because given that we're talking about data um lucy's question uh i guess links in uh pretty well with this so lucy said 
in my field of MR imaging, the raw data for a study can amount to a huge amount of data. The overhead involved in sharing are massive, so I can see why few people do this. I don't think I have a solution, but it would be great to reuse this expensive data. So I guess it's more it's more of a comment. But do you have any question, any sort of comments on that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it always takes time. That's that's a given. Like putting data publicly or code publicly takes time. It is it is always something that takes time. I've heard this comment a lot of time, and people are always like, you know, saying, yeah, but is it really worth it to me? Uh, and well, I understand. Like, I mean, you, after all, you want to keep your job, and if publishing is what matters, why would you bother sharing the data? But it's Actually, it will benefit your career long term. Some, some of the grant uh, applications actually do value this. And another thing is like if you put your data online, people will cite it. They will like when they use it, they will have to cite it. And if it is available, people will have more, uh, you know, urgent more needs for it. And they will eventually realize, oh, this is already available. I can just reuse that. So I'm, I, I understand the cost of it. I just think that it's it's worth it. OK, brilliant. Um, thank you so much. So. We'll take one more question just because I'm very curious <laughs> in the answer uh, and I think I think it's a great question. So it's from uh, Wolfgang. So he mm -hmm. said, how do you see our potential for building larger research collaborations that can employ measures to safeguard quality and employ internal peer review processes as done, for example, in physics research collaborations at the CERN? Um, yeah, I don't I don't really know. <laughs> it's, it's a complicated <laughs> question. Yeah, I mean, Eventually, I think what the kind of thing that we're pushing for, many of my co-authors and I, and many other people, obviously, I'm just talking just for myself, uh, may, maybe for them now, is that uh, we 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 switch from from a science-centric perspective to a career-centric perspective or a name-centric perspective, and what is happening at CERN is the opposite of this, right? They just want things that they're doing to to work out and. I think, I mean, we somehow maybe forgot a little bit the science is just a collective iterative process for everyone. But I don't know how things will change and how you ensure quality if everyone is working on the same thing together. How can you even peer review stuff in the end? Like I've seen papers in physics and maths that are just like 99 offers. Then how do you handle conflict of interest? It's, uh, it's very, very hard. Um, getting messages in the chat, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a complicated question. I don't really have an answer for it. I think mm -hmm. chatting about it is the, is the first step. Uh, that's probably, I don't know, I don't have an answer. I, I wish yeah. I did, uh, but let's keep chatting about it for sure. Uh, that's yeah, probably think, the best thing to do. I think if you had, if you had an answer and you would be single-handedly solving the reproducibility crisis in, in COVID, that would be a <laughs> yeah. big risk. Um, Right, Lani, thank you so much. So we, we still have quite a few questions, but but we do need to move on. Uh, but I do want to remind everyone that we'll do a roundtable discussion um, at the end.